We are in Romans chapter 15. I think we can go through 15 and 16 today. I don't want to rush anything, but a lot of the uh, verses in 16 are just uh, greet so and so and so and so, and uh, which tells us that the Apostle Paul knew many of the people. He named 28 people plus households and the brethren that are with them and the saints. So he knew a lot of the people in the church there in Rome. And uh, Romans 15, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I pray that You would give us the eloquence, the clarity, and the understanding, Lord, to appreciate properly reverence Your inspired Word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Romans 15 begins, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. Now, it's important to understand something. Christ not pleasing himself means he pleased the Father. Right. A lot of Christianity today has substituted that for pleasing the people. Uh -huh. You say, well, Brother Mark, he says please his neighbor, but you're missing something. You've you got to look at the whole thing that Paul is saying here. Okay? I've been told numerous times by pastors that they were called to be a servant of this people, so whatever the people want is what they do. Hmm. Well, that leads to what we have in America today, right? Yeah. Uh, in other words, you're a hireling. Yep. And you're there to uh, get your paycheck, and that's about it. That's right. It says, even Christ, so we're comparing to Christ, his example, please not himself, but as it is written. Okay, so we have a standard whereby we can interpret these words. The reproaches of them that reproached thee fell on me. Now, that's in Psalm 69, 7. And it says here, because for thy sake I have borne reproach, Shame hath covered my face. I am become a stranger unto my brethren, and an alien unto my mother's children. For the zeal of thine house yeah. hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of them that reproached thee are fallen upon me. So is it talking about Jesus pleasing people or pleasing God? God. Okay. But in doing God's business, we are reaching people. Amen. It's got to be in that order. Okay? So, we then that are strong, doing God's business, ought to bear the infirmities of the weak as is appropriate in God's business, and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good and edification in God's business, right. according to God's business, Accor uh, for his good in God's definition. Okay? Yes. To edification. So, we then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. Yes. Uh, Jesus was pleasing God. Jesus is catching reproach aimed at God for the sake of God's business. Jesus did not come down here to please Himself. That is sure. And I don't know why that we as those who are redeemed by Him called into His service uh, by the very nature of our redemption, we are ambassadors for Christ because we are now His people on earth. Yep. All right, We are His hands. We are His feet. When we align ourselves with His work by being saved thereby, we also become part of the pillar and the ground of the truth. We also become a part of those who represent His name to the world. Yeah. You have a testimony. If you're here, you've repented, you've been born again, you have a story that God wants you to tell the world. Alright? And so you become an ambassador for Christ. So, why do we get the idea that we can please ourselves? If we're not living for a higher cause than ourself, we're not following Jesus. We're not a part of His kingdom. If we're, being too, if we're too busy being a good Joe... A good old boy, a nice guy. Too busy making sure that everybody thinks we're cool or nice or, or you know, nobody thinks we're a fool for Christ's sake. 
You know, we had a, 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 a message that we listened to. Talked about that fire that Peter stood by that night. Warming himself with those Roman soldiers. Talking with those Roman soldiers. And while he was warming himself with that fire, Jesus was on trial. While he was warming himself with that fire, he was avoiding lining himself up with Jesus. While he was warming himself with that fire, he wanted everyone there to think that he was okay. He didn't want their displeasure. He didn't want them turning on him. He didn't want them uh, dragging him over there with Jesus in that situation. So he was trying to avoid connection with Jesus because he happened to be at their fire. He happened to be warming himself at their fire in their company and he did not want that to be a bad experience. Too often, too often, we think we can go warm ourselves at the world's fire and we can, we can warm up there and we can talk and avoid connection. Well, Peter went out and wept bitterly and repented of that. And I hope right. that if you've been doing that, you will too. Amen. True gospel liberty is not liberty from love, from righteousness, from courtesy, from kindness. 2 Corinthians 3.17 says, Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And only there. That's Christian liberty. Yep. So, we then that are strong, are you strong? Are you sure? Who says you're strong? Are we going by God's standard of strength? Or are we going by man's standard of strength? Are you successful? Are you beautiful? Are you wise? How do you know? Who says? Mm -hmm. Who says? Jesus said through His Word, through His Apostle, if you're strong, you're not going to be using it to sass your mama, disobey your father, bully your little brother or sister. If you're strong, it's going to be shown in bearing the infirmities of the weak. Yes. For their edification. That's right. That's strong. Yeah. If you're strong, you're going to be doing God's business. Paul said, For though I be free from all men, yet I, have, I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, the Gentiles, as without law. In other words, he was able to fellowship with the Gentiles. It doesn't right. mean he was lawless. Right. It means he was able to fellowship and eat and reach out to the Gentiles. Um, it says, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. Right. That I might gain them that are without law, the Gentiles. It doesn't mean they were lawless. It means they were Gentiles. Right. Okay? To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, listen, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Yes. That was a part of his salvation. That was a part of the race he had to run. I don't think we see it that way so often. Mm -hmm. Galatians 6.1, the same apostle said, Brethren, if any man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual. Okay, if that's you, raise your hand. <laughs> Who? Ye which are spiritual. We would like to... Okay, we then that are strong. Do, do I like to designate myself in there? Do I like to designate myself as spiritual? Well, don't, don't worry about figuring out where you categorize yourself. If you're spiritual, you'll be doing spiritual things and everybody will know it. Right. Restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself lest thou also be tempted. Bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So, do you classify yourself as spiritual? Well, patient discipline in humility. Patient discipleship in humility is a sign of true spirituality. Are you the strong one? Well, are you helping the weak 
is according to God's business? Let me ask you this. Are you strong? Does God think so? Does God think you're strong? There are those who think they're strong and they are servants of corruption. Yeah. They are slaves to their body. They're slaves to their pituitary gland. A little bitty gland in the top of their head controls their whole life. And they're a slave to it. There's, there's people who think they're strong and they're a slave to a little bitty piece of paper rolled up with weeds inside. Uh -huh. They're a slave to that little stick. But they think they're strong. They're a slave to a, 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 a can of fluid because they can't give it up. It controls their life. Oh, but they think they're strong. They, they're strong, but they can't control the little muscle inside their mouth. Uh -huh. Okay? Let me ask you, does God think you're strong? Does Satan think you're strong? Does Satan think you're strong? You see, these people, this person right here, what determines this guy's success? Or girl, I guess we'd have to go like this. There. Anyways. What determines their success? Well, what if they meet the standards over here? Is that success? Well, they think it is. The nine, probably 95% of the world would say yes. Now, if they went this way, and they met those standards, they lived up to those standards, is the world going to think they're a success? Is the world going to think they're strong? Did the world think that the Apostle Paul was strong? Nope. No. Did they think he was beautiful? Nope. I think he is. Mm -hmm. I love the Apostle Paul. Amen. Do they think he was wise? I think he was a very wise man. The world didn't think he was wise. They said he was a pestilent fellow. Mm -hmm. You're not strong because you can bully those littler than you. It's not strength when you transgress the law of God. It's not strength when you go about to establish your own righteousness. It's not strength when you become insensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading. It's not strength when you cease to be teachable. It's not strength when you callous yourself to correction and instruction. Amen. That is weakness. That's right. It is weakness. It is cowardice. It is shameful. It is failure. Now let's go on. Verse 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. In other words, what he's saying here is all the Old Testament Scriptures were written so that we would know God's standards and through the patience, through the comfort, through the instruction of the Scriptures, we would know what strength is. We would know what success is. We would know what beauty is. We would know what wisdom is. And we would have hope. Because we have direction. If you don't have direction, you don't have hope. Right. You're, you're wandering about. You're trying to put your anchor down. But, you know, <clears throat> these guys can't even figure out what is what over here. God has a consistent standard. You need to line up. You go over here, and they're arguing all the time about their standard. They don't know where they're at. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 10, it says, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Neither be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. 
Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh, he standeth, take heed lest he fall. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them. This is 2 Timothy 3. We listened to a, a man preaching this last week. He said his father had him memorize 2 Timothy 3. Okay? And so in 2 Timothy 3, uh, Paul told Timothy, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, yep. truly furnished unto all good works. You know what? You can't figure out these things here properly unless you read the Old Testament. That's right. Okay? Don't, don't take Jesus and interpret Him contrary to His own Father's Word, His own inspired Word. He is the Word. Don't do that and then think you're getting a proper picture of the whole Amen. thing. Verse 5. Now the God of patience and consolation grant you to be like-minded one toward another. What about let every man be persuaded in his own mind? Oh, maybe Paul forgot he said that a chapter ago. No. No. No, in matters that are indifferent, not moral, immoral, they're all moral. They're, they're not something that you need to argue about. Both people can be pleasing God on both sides of the issue. In those matters, someone coming into the church, receiving a new member, don't argue with them. But that doesn't, uh, uh, <clears throat> that doesn't uh, ignore the fact that when that person comes into the church, we expect them to grow. Right. When you come into the church, you say, well, let me be persuaded in my own mind. No, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say it's a right that you can claim. It's talking to church leaders so that we don't argue with people over every little nitpicky thing right off the bat. But as you come into the church, you may have some things that are superstitious fears that we talked about last week, unnecessary scruples that really are not backed by the Word of God, that you have adopted thinking it's piety, and therefore because you believe that it pleases God, you ought not to just discard it right away. But if it's something that's really not backed by Scripture, hopefully you will mature in your understanding and be able to rightly define these issues. And so we all will then grow up into Him in all things. So, eventually, the goal is uh, the God of patience and encouragement, consolation, grant you to be like-minded one toward another according to Christ Jesus. That's the same thing as saying that we may grow up into Him in all things. That you may, be with, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ that ye may with one mind and one mouth. Yes. Unity, not in spite of truth. It's not, the, it's not a spirit of unity. Okay? It's not just a feeling of unity because we ignore doctrine. We get together and ignore everything that is divisive. Okay? No. This is unity based on truth. Yes. It's not unity ignoring truth. This is unity as a result of growing, being teachable, of doctrine, instruction, and correction, and reproof. That's what God wants. Romans 16, 17, right in the next chapter, he says, I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they are such, uh, that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. In 1 Corinthians 1.10, he said, I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. If you went and visited a church, and you were seriously considering moving your family across the United States to be a part of a church, 
and you heard ten different opinions floating around. You could tell they weren't unified. You could tell they all had their own little ideas about things, but they were putting up with one another on Sunday. Would you consider them a spiritual group of people because of all the diversity? No. <laughs> no. <clears throat> That's what some people say. The more diversity, the more spiritual because we're letting every man be persuaded in his own mind. That's not what he's talking about. No. Okay? We need to be in the Word enough and we need to be humble enough to where eventually the Spirit of God, we are not getting in His way. If it's, if it's Jesus speaking through me, and it's Jesus speaking through Levi, and it's Jesus speaking through Philip, and it's Jesus speaking through Micah, and it's Jesus speaking through Randall, guess what? We're all going to speak the same thing. That's right. Okay? And that there be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Really? Seriously? What would that require? That would require me getting out of the way, right? Yep. Completely out of the way. And letting Jesus have His way. Ephesians 4.11 gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Okay, let's move on. Verse 7. Wherefore, receive ye one another, as Christ also received us to the glory of God. How are we to receive one another? As Christ received us. How did Christ receive you? Just come as you are and stay as you are? Unconditional love and acceptance? Is that how Christ received you? Nope. Not the, not the true Christ. No. Christ received you not on the basis of race, color, size, shape, ability, Jew, Gentile. No, He didn't receive you based on any of that. That would be respect to persons. Mm -hmm. Okay? He received you on the basis of repentance and obedient faith. Right. And anybody can do that. All of you can do that. And Christ will only receive those who do that. That's right. So... We need to be glad and happy to receive anybody on that basis. Amen. Anybody That's right. on that basis. A genuine repentance, an obedient faith, a humble desire to grow up into Him in all things. It doesn't matter where you've been, who you are, what your race, size, shape, ability, Jew, Gentile. None of that should matter if there's a genuine repentance, a humble living faith. That's how we receive people. And that's how we're supposed to receive one another. Yep. And uh, if, if you have that, you should feel accepted and loved in this congregation. If you don't have that, don't be surprised. Amen. If you feel a little awkward and out of place. That's right. Verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister, the word diakonos, a minister of the circumcision, the Jews, for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. That he had a he had a dual ministry, and he's going to show that here. And Paul is summing up what he's been explaining in the book of Romans. He said, Now I say, Jesus Christ was the Messiah of the Jews, the promised Messiah, a minister of the circumcision, a deacon of the Jews for the truth of God. He was coming down to fulfill God's promises to Israel, to Abraham's seed, in, in, in the sense of Israel, okay? Yeah. And, verse 9, and, big and, that the Gentiles might glorify God for His mercy. So he was also coming to draw a remnant of believing Gentiles. Now Paul has explained all that and quoted many scriptures to back it up. So he is talking here about the fact that Jesus Christ came to take a believing remnant of Jews and to gather out a believing remnant of Gentiles into one body, the church. And that he is going to, that's going to be his bride. <clears throat> um, as it is written, For this cause I will confess thee among the Gentiles, and sing unto thy name. And again he said, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again Isaiah said, 
There shall be a root of Jesse, and he shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, and him shall the Gentiles trust. Notice the distinction. We talked about this a little bit last Sunday, I think. The distinction between Jew and Gentile is still there. Yeah. Okay? If a Jew forsakes Judaism, then basically they become as a Gentile. They're no longer the circumcision. Okay? They become the uncircumcision. And God didn't call the Jews to become the uncircumcision. Right. So, though we don't understand all the particulars of it, Paul said clearly in Corinthians, if you're called in circumcision, be not uncircumcised. If you're called in uncircumcision, be not circumcised. And, this, and the words mean, if you're called in as a practicing Jew, do not cease to be a practicing Jew. And if you're called as a Gentile, don't become a practicing Jew. Now, Obviously, much of what is practicing Jew was done away with in AD 70. The temple, the city, everything was destroyed. But it seems to me they still ought to do what they could do. Yes. Because I don't see that they were allowed. There's no, there's no scripture that says Jesus is going to come and there's not going to be any Jew-Gentile. We're all just going to be Gentiles. No, it says we're all going to be Christians. <coughs> there's neither Jew nor Gentile nor barbarian nor male nor female. Oh, that means women don't have to dress like women? No, that's not what it's saying. Uh -huh. There's still a distinction. Right. Okay, so don't don't run too far with this concept. Get it in the context of all Scripture. Right. Um, Paul said, Give none offense, neither to the Jew, nor to the Gentile, nor to the church of God. Those distinctions are still there. And in the church, there's still Jew and Gentiles together. Believing Jews and believing Gentiles. Okay, um, <clears throat> what he's quoting the scriptures for is to show that God's plan to send the Messiah as the deacon of Abraham's seed, okay, the fulfillment of the Messiah to the Jews, and to call the Gentiles was plan A. Yes. Calling the Gentiles was not plan B. Because plan A failed. Well, the Jews rejected him, so he... No, no, it was plan A. Right. Okay, he knew that the Jews of the nation would reject him. Their heart had waxed gross. He prophesied it before because he knew their hearts as a nation. He could see that there was only a small remnant. He called out his remnant. And then he opened the door to the Gentiles yes. at the appropriate time. Um, and, be it known to you, it's the same gospel. It's the same gospel to Jew and Gentile. In Acts 13, 46, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been preached, uh, spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Yeah. Okay, follow it through. Acts 28, 28. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. Acts 13, 42. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached in the next Sabbath. It's all the same gospel. Yes. Okay, verse 13. Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Believing Jews and Gentiles. The Jews had been kicked out of Judaism. The Gentiles were hanging on, trusting that they were engrafted into the vine. They're all, they're all rejected by the world. Okay? Their apostle is called a pestilent fellow. They were a small group. They weren't, they weren't the dominant religious group. They were persecuted. They were hated. They were slandered. But he said, if you believe what I've been explaining to you, you'll have joy and peace in believing. That you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. And I myself also am persuaded of you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, able also to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace, the office, the position that is given unto me of God that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles ministering the gospel of God. There's just one. That the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable. Now, notice the influence of the gospel. Notice what the gospel did and was supposed to do to the Gentiles if presented properly, okay? Okay that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. I have therefore 
whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ and those things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ hath not wrought by me, listen, to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. So, preaching the Gospels to the Gentiles created a people that were acceptable because they were sanctified by the Holy Ghost and they were obedient. Mm -hmm. We'll see that farther down too. Um... By the, Paul said in verse 26 that the, the gospel is made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Verse 20. Yea, so have I strived to preach the gospel not where Christ was named, lest I should build upon another man's foundation, but as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. For which cause also I have been much hindered from coming to you, but now having no more place in these parts, and having a great desire these many years to come unto you, Whensoever I take my journey into Spain, I will come to you. For I trust to see you in my journey, and be brought on my way through the word by you. If first I be somewhat filled with your company. But now I go unto Jerusalem to minister unto the saints. And we can read about that in Acts 21 through 24. Um, for it hath pleased them of Macedonia and Achaia to make a certain contribution for the poor saints which are at Jerusalem. You know, Philippi was the chief city of Macedonia, and Corinth is usually what they speak of when they speak of Achaia. Um, <clears throat> it has pleased them verily, and their debtors they are. Now listen to this. The Gentiles are debtors to the Jews. For if the Gentiles have been made partaker of their spiritual things, their duty is also to minister unto them in carnal things. When therefore I have performed this, and have sealed to them this fruit, I will come by you into Spain. Did he ever do that? Well, according to early church writings, after his first imprisonment, we know that he didn't go voluntarily to Rome. God worked that out roundabout way. He did go to Rome. That's what he was planning to do after going to Jerusalem anyway. He finally made it to Rome. He stayed there longer than he expected. And when he was released from that first imprisonment, this is speculation. We believe he was released from his first imprisonment. Most likely he went on to Spain, came back, was imprisoned again, and that's when he was martyred. Okay, but there's no clear record of it. Uh, Theodoret and some of the early church writers say that's what happened. Uh, the very fact that the Holy Ghost inspired him to make that plan and say these things makes it very probable. Um, the fact is, he was the apostle to the Gentiles, and the and the Spanish Peninsula there. Spain, Portugal, and that area had not yet received the gospel. He would be the most likely candidate to be the one to introduce the gospel to that realm as the apostle of the Gentiles. So most likely, it happened. Um, let's go to chapter 16. We're not going to read all of it. Uh, verse 16 says, Salute one another with an holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Now, people say, well, that was a custom of the day. Oh, was it a custom for Jews to greet Gentiles? Was it a custom for Greeks, barbarians, rich and poor, slaves and free men to greet? No, it wasn't. And that was a part of the Christian church. Right. Okay? They took something that was a custom and they made it a Christian thing for Jews and Gentiles, Greeks, barbarians, bond and free to all greet as brethren. And that was a special mark of the Christian church. Verse 17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine of which you have received, and avoid them. Does the church have a right to tell me who to avoid? Mm -hmm. yep. Does the church have a right to forbid me being friends with certain people? Yep. In reality, yes. Okay? Anyone who insists on holding to that which is contrary to the church's teachings. Anyone who is militating against the work and the testimony of the church should be avoided. Yes. Okay, it doesn't mean you have to cover your eyes and ears and run. It means you don't have you don't build bonds of friendship. It means when you're you react your connection with them is one of evangelism, is one of speaking the truth, right. is one of witnessing. You don't become buddy buddy with them. Right. Okay. He that walks with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Now, that means you can witness to fools, but you can't become a companion of fools. 
1 Corinthians 5, 6. Your glory is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? When you begin to be a companion of fools, it's going to affect you. You cannot go out and be a companion of fools and not be affected. You can't go out and hang around and buddy-buddy with people that are carnal, people who live by these standards right here, and think that you're not going to be affected. That's right. Your definitions of these things is going to be uh, skewed and confused when you start hanging around with people of the world. That's right. Be not deceived. 1 Corinthians 15.33 is speaking to you. Be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. Be not deceived. In other words, if you don't think so, you are deceived. That's right. Evil communication. That means, the communication means you are being a companion. You are fellowshipping. You are interacting. You are receiving. You are, you are buddy-buddying with these people. Okay? It will corrupt good manners. Galatians 5 9, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. This forbids you to be a companion, a comrade, with those who don't follow apostolic faith and practice. You can minister, you can be a witness, you can be a testimony, but you can't be a comrade. That's right. Verse 18 For they that are such. Serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. Oh, but they say Jesus. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. The simple here meaning the trusting, the inexperienced, the unsuspecting. Okay? Good words and fair speeches. They're not going to be obvious. They're going to be nice. Uh -huh. That's right. Verse 19, For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad therefore on your behalf. But yet I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple. This is a different word concerning even, evil. The word simple here is not the same as the word simple above. And again, it would be nice if our translators had not made a connection where there wasn't a connection. Sometimes they miss a connection where there is. And God bless them. Thank God for the Bible. And the King James is the best translation available. But, a situation like this, okay, we're not supposed to be naive and stupid concerning evil. We're supposed to be unadulterated, unmixed with evil. The word simple up above means inexperienced, unsuspecting. Okay? We're not supposed to be ignorant and unsuspecting concerning evil. We're supposed to be wise concerning that which is good and unmixed with evil. No, you don't have to learn and go delve into it and figure it all out, okay? So yes, you're going to be a little bit unlearned about evil, but it's, it's, this is not exactly what that word means in the sense that they deceive the hearts of the simple. Well, okay. If I'm supposed to be simple, then how can I avoid being deceived? That's the problem there. That's not what it's saying. Uh, you're not supposed to be simple concerning these evil people. The Apostle Paul obviously wasn't. He had them all figured out. Their God is their belly. Their God is their appetites. They live by these standards. And they have good words and fair speeches. They deceive the hearts of the inexperienced, the unsuspecting. You young people... There in some ways you cannot avoid being inexperienced and unsuspecting because you haven't been around the block as many times as mom and dad have. Okay? We've been around the block a few times. We've seen a few things. We've heard a few things. We've been experienced uh, and been witnesses of a few things. So you need to listen. When we tell you, you know, that's not good, stay away from that. What's wrong with it? No, don't, don't ask us what's wrong with it. Just stay away from it. Okay? Um... <clears throat> Be wise concerning that which is good. And don't be, and, and be unex, uh, unadulterated, unmixed concerning evil. Don't be delving into it. Just stay away from evil. Why did people change the apostolic pattern? Was it not Jesus plus these evaluations? 
Was it not Jesus plus appetites? Was it not Jesus plus my belly? Mm -hmm. Their God is their belly. You look at the Christendom of today. Why? They're not serving the same Jesus I'm serving. But you start talking to them about serving the true Jesus. Well, I feel. Mm -hmm. Well, I would have to give up. Well, I don't want. Mm -hmm. Okay? So their God is their belly, their appetites. Colossians 2, 4, And this I say, lest any man beguile you with enticing words. <clears throat> 2 Peter 2, 3, And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Feigned words, enticing words, fair words, good words. Is that all it takes for you? Can you not see past? Verse 20. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. Isn't that a verse? The God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet. Do you know that's the way to get peace? Yep. That's the only way to have peace, governmentally speaking, is to bruise and subdue the adversary. That's right. Um, it's interesting, Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. Okay? And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. How do you think he got peace? With the government on his shoulders. Verse 7, Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord will perform this. Peace with God comes through repentance and surrender. You must submit to Him. Peace with our fellow man, we're supposed to seek that as much as lieth in us. In other words, right. as much as it's my responsibility, okay? Government peace comes through war and defeating of those who break the peace. Peace in society comes through law and order. And the good man of the house, the way he is home has peace is when he watches and doesn't suffer his house to be broken through. There's peace there in that home. Revelation 19, 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Why would he want to do that for? He's the Prince of Peace. Exactly. That's how we're going to get it. That's right. Verse 25. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery, which was kept secret since the world began. That mystery, by the way, is the bringing in of the Jews and Gentiles, not some new gospel, not some different gospel. Okay? It's a bringing together of the Jews and Gentiles into one body. I'll read you quickly. Ephesians, it says here, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you word, how that by revelation you made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ the God, uh, through the gospel. Okay? Now, there is no question. That's the mystery. Right. But listen to what he says here. But now, verse 26, But now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Yep. Summing up the whole thing. Okay? That mystery is now made manifest by the scriptures of the prophets. That means by the Old Testament scriptures, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, according to God's law and purpose. It's made known to all the Gentile nations, all nations, for the obedience of faith. And so, if you want to be a part of the bride, 
If you want to be saved, if you want to be a part of God's program, you've got to get with the program. You've got to have a church that accepts both Jew and Gentile, according to the scriptures of the prophets, that demands the obedience of faith, that has the same gospel for both. There's got to be a body of believers. There can't be just individual people scattered all over. He brought them together in one body, and that's represented by local bodies. Um, there's no avoiding the fact that there were local bodies with local bishops, local elders, uh, autonomous bodies, all led and governed by bishops, which were patterned after the churches of Judea. Okay? There's no debating that issue. Nope. And every local church was autonomous under God and under the apostles to have a bishop and elders and a people. And they were supposed to meet together. They were supposed to evangelize. They were supposed to take up an offering, have communion. They were supposed to do what we are trying to do right here. Yes. And the reason we're trying to do it is because that's what they were supposed to do. <clears throat> the obedience of faith. What is the obedience of faith? Well, you can have obedience and not have faith. You can go through the motions, but your heart not be in it. You can have the obedience of dreaded fear. When you obey a tyrannical government, it's not the obedience of faith. That's right. Obedience of faith is when it says, I believe that God Almighty, the Creator of this world, knows best. His law is always the wisest, smartest, most appropriate, most loving thing to do in every circumstance. And why would I want to do anything else? That's the obedience of faith. Yes. I'm going to do what He said, how He said to do it, to the utmost, I'm going to love it, I'm going to appreciate it, because my God is showing me the smartest, most appropriate way to live, the smartest, most, the best investment of my energies and time, He is revealing to me through His Word. Yes. And therefore, that's the only thing I want to do. Yeah. That's what I want to do. I want to know Him and the power of His resurrection, the fellowship of His sufferings. That's the obedience of faith. Yes. I believe His Word. I believe His wisdom. And that's what I want to follow. The obedience of faith. Going through the motions. You, you, know, you, can, you can say you have faith. But faith requires action. Right. Faith that is not exercised is nothing but a word. Faith must be exercised to be faith. When you begin to exercise faith in what I'm speaking of, I believe. I believe this book and I want to chart my life by it. That's the obedience of faith. The reason the gospel is preached is so that you will exercise the obedience of faith. That makes you eligible for the atonement. That makes you eligible for being saved. Without that, all is lost. Yep. Let's stand together. There's no, a number of things that we could hit on. I mean, there's, there's so much that we, we basically hit the high points and made sure that the confusion that has been produced by the book of Romans is cleared up. It's not it's produced by the false interpreters right. of the book of Romans. The, the, uh, the Calvinists, the antinomians and all that. We've tried to go through Romans and set the record straight so that you will have answers for those who are confused on the subject. But there's a lot in Romans that can still be gleaned. Mm -hmm. Depending on what topic, what doctrine, what argument you're dealing with. So I encourage you to go back and re-listen to what... Make sure that when you read through the book of Romans, you can explain it. Right. When somebody takes you to a certain place in Romans, make sure you remember how that fits so you can explain it intelligently and correctly then you will be a good workman yes. in the vineyard. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts before we go to prayer?